Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good? See, that's the type of energy we need in the world. Welcome, everyone. My name is Claudia de la Cruz from the People's Forum. I'm very excited and happy to be with you all and be in conversation with our comrade friend, Lisa Armstrong. Um, Lisa is a professor in the Program for the Study of Women and Gender at Smith College. She has contributed immensely, I'll say that again, immensely to the development of TPF's Revolutionary Feminism course. So if you've taken that course before, Lisa is one of the folks that has helped coordinate and think through the curriculum and has been very open to teaching um, based on her expertise and experience. And so we're really grateful and happy to have you here. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And my first time back in New York for two years, of course, this is the first place I come. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome home. Exactly. That's how it feels. So we are going to be engaging in a conversation around the All India Democratic Women's Association and its strategies of resistance. This amazing book was written by Lisa and the research work that she did, participatory research, solidarity research with women in struggle in India. Um, it's a book that covers the history and talks a lot about the context, not only in India, but internationally, um, addresses the issues of gender and neoliberalism, one of the biggest plagues that we have to deal with today. And so I'm really excited to speak with Lisa today, mostly because we are currently living in a worldwide crisis, which is a crisis of capitalism. And we know that when crisis hits in the system, those who are in the margins are the ones who suffer the most. And that means women. That means trans, gender, non-conforming communities, black, brown, indigenous communities. And it means the global south. Um, we, thankfully, have a history of resistance. <laughs> we have a legacy of fighting back structures of oppression and exploitation. And a lot of that is what we will be talking and addressing tonight. So I'm very thankful to be in conversation with my sister, friend, and comrade Lisa around this. Yeah. Um, so I think we are going to go right into the questions. OK. And Lisa's already warned me that she's going to speak from the heart <laughs> and from the experiences and the witnessing of this movement and how it developed. I just wondered, um, how did you come to do this research work? How did you come to meet the women? Yeah, yeah. It was by accident, um, like most good things are. I was in a graduate program and had, after a year, had enough and stepped away. Um, and because of my partner, who was from India, we went to India, and I took some time to study Spanish. Um, it didn't make sense, but there I was, and also learning Hindi. And while I was there, it was the first Gulf War. So this is 1991, and I, it was my first time living somewhere outside of the U.S., and um, it, as an as a uh, an adult as someone who was no longer a child. And the question became, how do I protest a war that my country has begun in West Asia from a location is, that is not the United States? And I was living in New Delhi, um, uh, had by that point been there a couple of months, and had started to meet people. And um, I found out about a rally in uh, the center of New Delhi. They are no longer held there, but in the boat club of New Delhi. And um, I went to the rally because I was enraged, because I couldn't believe what the government, my government, was doing um, in West Asia. And I got there, and um, there were effigies burning of um, Bush Sr. 
there it was it was huge it was massive um and i was standing waiting to go to the main area where the speakers were and i could overhear i could see a whole group of women in front of me and and i i didn't know who they were and they didn't know who i was and they said in hindi oh look at that that gora that white woman they said she must be russian and it was at that moment i'm like oh i feel seen and so i went in and um sat down and while waiting in that line they read the same group of of women reached out to me and and said you know who are you why are you here what's happening and drew me into their local organizing it turns out they were women from the all india democratic women's association they were from an area called Karobag in uh, northern, north, the north part of New Delhi. And I just started going and hanging out in their houses. Um, and some of the big campaigns that were happening at that time were around domestic violence in the neighborhood. And um, that's how it started. It started from a rally that I didn't know if I would be welcomed at. I didn't know if I belonged there. I didn't know what it meant to protest outside of the location of my citizenship. And that, that introduction was um, a kind of embrace and a welcoming that pulled me into their politics. And through pulling me the, into their politics, it pulled me into politics more carefully, more closely, more meaningfully when I returned back to the United States. So the, I, I always think about social movements and the type of work that we do, but to think about 11 million people, <laughs> can you imagine that? <laughs> 11 million people organized, poor, from the rural areas, from the urban areas, mm -hmm. 23 states. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's massive. Mm -hmm. That is massive. And when I first read about um, the association, I was like, I couldn't conceive it. Yeah. It's something that I, I think if you live in the United States, a mass movement of that sort is unconceivable because it's something that we have not experienced. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, you know, when you come into contact with them, what are some of the things that you, that you begin to want to draw out from their politics? What are some of the things that you want to learn? Um, what context were they... It, uh, where did they, where did they emerge from? Like mm -hmm. these are some of the things that I'm yeah. I'm asking myself. Yeah. So I'm, I see two pieces to that. So one, you think of 11 million. At one point in 2006, they were 25 million. Um, and what we see in the numbers now is the attrition due to the extreme uh, uh, repression um, that activists are facing right now. And so there's the numbers. And so I met them at, at a mass level, right? This was an anti-war rally in the center of New Delhi. And it, it just, it felt incredible. Um, it was like a mela. It was like a, um, a, like a party of a certain sort. Um, and what I realized soon thereafter, and this is that um, it, was, it became the, the component that I became most fascinated with is it's not about the numbers just like the, the 11 million, the 25 million, it's that all of those numbers have clubs. And that club-based, so the building block of 11 million, rather than just being, because when you go to a rally, you see just buses of people coming in and streaming out. Inside each bus, inside each group of maybe 300 to 2,000 people, are 25 clubs, 35 clubs. And that club basis of building a movement for me became, it's something that I still think about as a building block for a mass movement. So rather than losing your locality or losing the, the focus of your struggles, so when I went back to Karolbag, the organizing around domestic violence, that wasn't being done as 11 million. It was being done in their neighborhood. And what the women were doing was bringing in the trade union organizers, bringing in the, um, uh, the, the other sort of social groups in their neighborhoods and saying domestic violence isn't a women's issue. It's an issue we are organizing around and we are organizing you. So it was men, women, children. Everyone was involved in a domestic violence campaign, but it was based, it was led, and it was um, pushed 
by these units um, of, of women who were part of this left, larger left um, circle of organizations. It's interesting that you talk about that intersectoral type of organizing because mm -hmm. I think that's also one of the one of the big lessons that comes out of the out of that movement. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how that's organized? Like, yeah. how is that organized? And also, um, there's a shift from that women's issues piece yeah. to understanding more the class analysis, more the class consciousness, more the development of class-based building. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. And I, there's one additional component to your, question, your previous question, which is they're coming out of an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial history. They are not divorced from the past, right? So India gained, how they say it is, gained independence from the British in 1947. In India, they fought for independence and demanded it and won that independence. So it was not a giving. Um, that language um, around anti-colonial movements is important to untangle. Part of that movement is building something else. Even as you demand the end of a, a structure of exploitation, oppression is building to something else in its stead. And that quality is what, it, what groups like All India Democratic Women's Association brought from that history. You don't just want the end of an old regime. You want to build the new within. Um, and so in answer to your question with intersectoral organizing, the earlier form of organizing was how do we build a common movement? What, how can we pull a cross-class movement? What are issues that women face from the middle class as well as from the working classes in rural areas as well as urban areas, um, in uh, informal economy as well, well as formal economy and unwaged labor? And that method worked for a while, except with the rise of fascist elements, neo-fascist elements like the Hindutva, um, the fissures within the larger society, and I think this is a place where we really have to think about our current conditions in this location, that the fissures of division, of difference uh, that are based in hierarchy became the way to break the movement. So if you're building move, uh, unity around a common issue and seeking that common issue as the way to build ties between disparate groups, if an organized movement breaks you along your differences, what do you do? How do you respond? So as in the 80s, with the rise of anti-Muslim violence in India, with the rise of um, Dalit, uh, anti-Dalit violence of um, the oppressed castes, the question became, how do we organize with this in our mind, not just what do we have in common, but how are we being broken along these lines of internal fracture? And that is where intersectoral organizing came in, and that's why they developed it. And it came out of a refusal to be divided on the basis of caste, not simply by saying uh, Hindus also support Muslims in India, or uh, upper castes also support uh, oppressed caste people, but instead saying, where is the leadership? And how are the movements of the most marginalized, the demands of the most marginalized, our concerns? And one of the organizers, a brilliant organizer, her name is Vasuki, she's still an amazing organizer in Tamil Nadu in the South, described to me this small word change. She said, I fight for us to use the word our, mine, uh, or we. So instead of saying this is a Dalit women's issue, say it is our issue. And that small thing, she said, hidden in it, embedded in it, was this kernel of intersectoral organizing. That the leadership comes from the location of fissure and discrimination and bigotry, and it becomes the location of unity, not instead of what is commonly held, but to sharpen what is commonly held. I think, you know, part of sometimes in the United States, when we think about these types of like that type of work, we think often about coalition building, uh -huh. right, which is which different. Is, is different, <laughs> is a very different thing. And I think building that type of unity, that class unity mm -hmm. um, has its complexities, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're talking about a social movement that has a proximity also to political organization. Mm -hmm. And so can you share a little bit more about yes. that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And this is one of, I, I, 
This is one of those things. This right? is when you get excited. I can <laughs> exactly. see it. Exactly. Um, so this is a women's movement linked to the Communist Party of India Marxist. It is a women's movement that does not require a membership. And so it's not whether or not you are a communist, whether or not you are a Marxist, whether or not you are a member of the CPM. But when you develop a campaign, what you have is the backbone of the movement behind you. And this is true of local movements, say around domestic violence is one example. Um, but there are many, many more. Um, or the um, distribution of public resources. Um, during the tsunami in 2004, I had the opportunity to go to a, um, a club that had done a lot of organizing, actually also around domestic violence, but we're taking up after the tsunami how uh, goods were being distributed. And it originally had been funds um, distributed to families whose livelihood had been destroyed by the tsunami. And the women in the organization, and it happened to be the day I was there, um, it was about a week after the tsunami. And this, had, this plan had been made a long time ago, and it, it happened to be a week after that, that big tsunami in 2004. And the um, women said, no, we don't want money. It's getting spent on alcohol. And, and as I, I was walking around the neighborhoods with them, they said, see, all these men are drunk. These men are drunk. And, and I said, we want goods. We want particular goods. And so we did something called a road roko outside of the district collectors, which is to lie in the road in front of these trucks. Um, and so there we were lying in the road and the, the um, uh, district collector came out who's sort of a local hotshot, like a uh, official, um, and just started uh, abusing them and using horrible language, which they were translating to me as it was happening. But all of a sudden, they, they, we stood up, and I saw in his face fear. So the very person who was using this you know, terrible language realized that they were the All India Democratic Women's Association. And th at that moment, he started apologizing. He said he never meant to use that language. He regrets using that language. He will never use it again to women, even if they're lying in the road in front of his trucks. And he gave in to all of the demands at that moment. Um, and it was just for me, being a visitor, that was my, I went back and years later, uh, I, maybe one year later, and lived there for a while with these, and worked with these same women. I realized why he was afraid, because they had no fear. Um, and they, they had the strength of the party, but they were at the front of the movement. It was a strength in uh, kind of solidity. They could draw on trade union members. They could draw on party members. But they were the front of the movement. He was afraid of them. Thank you for that. I mean, it speaks to how powerful political organization, social movements that are actually rooted in building base are. And so these are some of the things that we need to kind of draw out of this conversation as lessons. Um, and I, I want to go into that. I want to go into that question of lessons and strategies because um, yesterday we just we had a panel yesterday around reproductive justice. We talked about how mm -hmm. reproductive justice is part of a larger working class struggle, mm -hmm. um, and how our working class um, advances that we've made through all the years through struggles mm -hmm. um, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears are being dismantled constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in this crucial moment, we could look to the South for many lessons, and I mean the global South, because a lot of what is coming in intensified into the United States has been tested around the world. And so what are some of the lessons that we could draw um, from Iowa, um, Iowa? Um, what are some of the strategies we could draw? What are some of the things we also understanding that we're in a different context? That's right. That's right. Sorry, I, it always takes me a beat to, to kind you of. You don't need to apologize for that. that. Silence is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I, I think the constancy, the refusal to go away, um, one of the things I've already mentioned were the units, the way that they were so neighborhood based and the linkages were so tight. But that very quality, so in Haryana, which is, if you, if, did anyone pay attention to the farmer protests? Were you aware of the protests against? So a, a bill was almost, without mention, dropped on as law of the land 
around the the floor seal the the um, uh, floor price for farm goods, and it would have devastated particularly small land holding farmers. Um, and these are federal laws, and they they come like sort of a bolt from the blue. And uh, that refusal to agree, that refuse, so they could say, but, but it's law. It's been passed into law. It's done. And they're like, no, it's not done. Um, and we will, we will camp out until you are sick of us, and we will stay camped out until you can take it no more. And that's precisely what happened. So in a pandemic, under a lockdown, in a point where migra uh, mi the migration of workers and people were happening all over the country with absolutely no support from the government, they just said, go home now, anyone who was outside of their home location. In those conditions, they were running a shutdown effectively of the of the federal city of, of New Delhi. And the borders are the borders of Uttar Pradesh and Haryana, but the support coming from Punjab as well, another uh, very um, uh, powerful um, agricultural state. And the women were at the absolute heart of this. And I think if we were to learn a lesson, one of the lessons is around fear. One of the lessons is around the refusal to be afraid, the refusal to take the, the so-called law of the land and say, oh, this is done. Yeah, you've wrapped it up like the bow has been tied. We don't like it, but we'll learn how to survive. I think both of those, what I saw throughout, so it was really 1991, which is the emergence of um, these policies we call neoliberalism, which is the shrinking of the public sphere and, and just offloading of survival onto individuals and the breaking of community for that survival. And... Um, to about 2006, so 15 years, um, again and again, I, the, the stories that I heard told when I was spending time with organizers, long-term organizers, and let me tell you, spending 15 years with them, big chunks of my life were organized by them. And they would make sure every year I would come back and they'd be like, now did you do that thing we told you to do? And sometimes they would take my partner out to lunch and he would think, oh, we're gonna have a nice lunch. No, that's not what happened. Um, they would organize him too and make sure that he was being correctly behaving. And that refusal, both humor and the refusal to be afraid, the unwillingness to let private be private, um, I think all of those are things that go against maybe, maybe we don't admit. Um, but because they were in these small groups, you could be afraid every day. Um, if you're going against gender norms, uh, let's say around land ownership, you could you could be in danger every day. You could face a social boycott where um, your neighbors wouldn't sell you basic goods like flour or bread or, or milk or eggs. Um, and I, I that's the question I I wish I'd written more about is how they refuse to be afraid. Um, and how they refused to back down. And I think what we saw in the farm protests was through a careful building of a supportive community, a um, overturning of gender norms in how the, the um, camps were run, who was doing the cooking, who was doing the cleaning. All of that was restructured um, during the farmer protests that lasted over a year. Um, it's truly an incredible thing when we think about pandemic organizing, we should be turning there. We should be looking at what happened there because it was a massive victory for a government that wants to say, we hold all the power. You are just the underlings to do our bidding. Thank you for that. And hopefully at some point we will be able to get more writings on, on those. Because you said, <laughs> I hope that would have, I hope I would have written more about that. Um, I think in terms of, you know, what you were talking about, the refusal to be afraid and the mm -hmm. refusal to agree. A lot of the times um, our positions in the United States are more declarative. We stand against, mm -hmm. um, we oppose. And the aspect of mobilizing and organizing uh, takes a lot. I'm wondering about, like we do political education here in this space. Yeah. I'm wondering what political education looks like to them. Mm, such a good question. I'm told in the farmer organizing, they had political education in the camps, in the 
um, in the, the locations where the blockades. Um, I attended some of their uh, trainings, and they this may be counterintuitive, but they tend to be very practical. How do you run a meeting? How do you keep minutes? How do you take notes? How do you build consensus? How do you do run votes? Mm -hmm. um, because the All India Democratic Women's Association, many of their members um, don't have literacy. There are literacy components to it. Um, because these are areas that don't have Wi-Fi, I know there's a language of the universality of Wi-Fi, even mm -hmm. phones are not always a way into that world. Um, so it, it's skill building. Mm -hmm. A lot of the education is, is really that, mm -hmm. is, is like things that we think somehow one should already know. Mm -hmm. Well, skill building is also something that we, we need to take back in our movements here. I think because we've gotten so accustomed to the internet yeah. <laughs> and social media, there's the aspects of organizing in communities and building that base. And when you speak about the farmers movement and how they responded in the midst of COVID, yeah. it speaks to a level of consciousness that our livelihoods depend on us mobilizing. Mm -hmm. And I think in our communities, we, we have a lot of work to do as mm -hmm. people of consciousness and, and people that are organizing um, to do that groundwork, to mm -hmm. do that skill, uh, skill based building mm -hmm. work. Um, I'm wondering, you, well, you and I were talking earlier, and you talked about solidarity. Um, mm. And obviously, there are aspects of, of being in solidarity mm. that become more complicated with COVID. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and ba basically what were you thinking when we addressed the question of solidarity, that would be good. Mm. You could share it with us. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is being a, a researcher based here doing this work, there's, um, there's an extractive model of scholarship that is um, as repulsive as it sounds, where one goes, learns, takes, puts it in pages, gets tenure, right? That extractive model is untenable. Um, one of the aspects I think maybe that you could take alongside that, maybe it comes back to that first rally, which is we don't get a choice where we're located, but how do we see the power in that location? How do we undo the relations of power that it is supposed to uphold. And the academy in this country is so, supposed to uphold ruling class power. That is what it is supposed to do. It is what it works hard to continue to do. Um, and I think in that context, one of the things I continue to think about is the ref one has to return. Maybe it's, it's slow time. It's like long time, solidarity time. Solidarity time, it may be that there's a spell of time. Maybe you have an elder in your family that you're caring for. Or maybe there's a moment when you need to take a break. Um, and, and when I start writing up some of these stories, that's something that in the All India Democratic Women's Association, they talk about activists who needed to take a break. Um, but to return is an act of solidarity to refuse to, to let go, um, even if there are breaks in time. And I think a lot of times with activism, we go fast. We're impatient. Um, and this solidarity time, I think, is a patient time. And it's a, it's a solidarity is a form of return, a refusal to let go. Um, I think it's an area in when I was doing the research that they really struggled with. Um, because the um, Communist Party of India Marxist does not have the same kinds of international ties. This is, again, 90s and early 2000s. Um, it is a party that um, split from the parties connected to the USSR. Um, so there's CPI and there's CPM, there's CPML. Um, and so international solidarity was something that... that they didn't have a home for, like a sort of set tracks for. Um, and I, it's something they talked about a lot. And one person gave a metaphor of a pencil. 
Um, it was a campaign around the Iraq War um, in 2002. And they said, how do we make the Iraq War meaningful for working class women, um, rural women, uh, day laborers in agricultural work? And they started a campaign to, um, to gather pencils. Um, and what they talked about with the pencil was not simply that this was a, a necessary item for a child to learn to, to write and to communicate, but also what are the what are the strengths of a movement that's international? So how can the hardship that they were facing in their own localities be, be held in that pencil? And then they shipped these pencils to Iraq, and it was part of a larger campaign. And I think these small, they're metaphorical, maybe symbolic, but it allows for struggles far, far away to be made material in the local instance. Um, I think these forms of solidarity in the moment we're in are equally important um, and to have them be material. I think in the farmer protests um, that social media was really powerful um, because it reminded them that they are not forgotten. They're not alone. Um, and in a lockdown, it, and you're running a blockade of, of the central city, it can feel pretty lonely um, as far as media and attention or knowledge of that your struggle is happening and the feeling like you can gather strength from that. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to go into your questions. Yes. I hope you all have yours. Me too. Um, Kate is going to help us with the mic. This is the moment where you all engage. Okay. Brave soul. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so you mentioned in the book and, and um, in the talk here uh, how uh, AIDWA, it's, it's like the, the women's organizing group of the, mm -hmm. the CPIM, right? The Communist yeah. Party in India. Um, and at least it, I, you, you kind of touched on this in the book, but I'm curious um, if you can give more background on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's somehow more than that, right? And mm -hmm. Like the, the Communist Party in India, it's actually like in power in some of the states. Like they're mm -hmm. kind of a status quo party at this point. Like mm. the, I think there's a view that, you know, sort of they're, I don't know, sort of lost their way or they're just not as sort of deeply into the, the um, kind of radical organizing um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that is so inspiring um, from Aidwa, right? Mm. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on that, um, if you have any thoughts on sort of where they diverged or mm. um, what the strategies that Idwa had that, that kind of mm. allowed them to maintain this kind of power and this kind of uh, grounding in, in, you know, real, true radical organizing. Yeah, that's a really good, good question. Um, I think there were a number of organizing methods that actually came out of All India Democratic Women's Association and made their way in to different degrees into the CPIM. Um, oftentimes, the way it's told, it's as if they're the puppets of the Communist Party. In fact, what I witnessed was not that. Um, they had the backing, they had the strength, sometimes they'd share offices. Um, with the, the CITU, the trade union linked with the CPIM. So there were resources that were shared. What I saw was a, a real autonomy um, as well to, to maintain that vibrancy and that creativity. This strategy of intersectoralism is one that, that did, to a certain degree, make it into some of the party organizing. Because what it, what it is asking, in effect, is that... that um, that the, the specificity of class politics are not uniform. The specificity of class politics means we have to look at religion. We have to look at caste. And that, um, that knowledge that to be clear, to be specific about struggles does not break class unity. In fact, it can strengthen class unity is one that I saw make its way into some of the CPIM struggles. I think your example, so you, you're mentioning um, Kerala, um, really is the, the state in India that has 
uh, um, a governance that's currently CPIM uh, coalition governments. Uh, so there are other parties in it, but they're all on the left. And historically, Bengal is, yes. And currently it is Trinibal, so um, yes. And I think in the case of Kerala, the, the, the experiments that I see um, the All India Democratic Women's Association doing there are even more, in some ways, more exciting. They're, so I don't know if anyone's seen the PARI website. Um, it's a, a, a website run by a, a rural journalist, uh, Sainath, P. Sainath. Um, and he tells these stories of rural women developing their own um, microfinance is already sort of branded by Grameen Bank, but a means for rural women to take over development um, and the disbursement of uh, decision making to the, the most grassroots levels, um, rather than having the decisions trickling down from the top, really coming up from the bottom. Um, and I think that's an area to look at Kerala, and they're just... I mean, Thomas Isaac is a place to go, um, and he's written a lot about the experiments being done in, in Kerala. But to a large degree, they happen outside of the English language press. Um, so it's really hard to hear the most creative work being done coming out of CPM-led movements. Um, but for the time in the locations where I was, in, mostly in Haryana and in, in Tamil Nadu, um, I think they're... I think there was a creative politics happening. I think just because my focus was um, all, all India Democratic Women's Association, it's harder for me to, to be able to articulate Kisan Sabha's work or the trade union work. The Kisan Sabha is the peasant union's work. Um, but that's a really good question. It was something I was thinking about a lot. Um, because of the language of this like top-down, if you're linked to a communist party, you don't have agency, you don't have autonomy. And that was so, on a daily basis, not what I was seeing. It was quite, quite different. There's another technique. Can I add one more technique? There's another technique that was developed, um, which was realizing that, so we have an idea here too, that you, you, you build leadership from the most oppressed people or the most exploited people. Again, Vasuki, who I mentioned, she's from uh, the organizer from Tamil Nadu, said to me, they did an analysis. They said, why is it that we have leaders from um, Dalit background, Muslim women leaders from all of these um, uh, unit groups? They, their leaders are from these um, communities. And then you, you move up to the Taluk level, which is the um, like a uh, county, um, and still we have leaders from some of the most oppressed groups. You go to the regional, the district level leadership, and suddenly caste reasserts itself, um, and um, privilege on the basis of religion reasserts itself, or class privileges from a middle class background reasserts itself. And she developed a whole strategy on how to refuse to let that happen. Because once you pass the taluk level, the county level, and you make it into that district level leadership, then the travel, um, the ability to move into the, the wider and wider levels of leadership is, succeeds. That, her insights, her, her focus on that quality also passed. I saw that move from uh, Aidwa into other party organizations. And I heard it talked about in those circles. So that's another example. So I was curious about some of the techniques that they use to encourage other genders to participate in anti like domestic violence um, yeah. organizing. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's important to ask, the, the, the first precept they started with is the home is not private. Um, that the violence in a community, whether it happens inside a family home or on the street itself, it is a community violence. The second component um, is that 
the response must be led by the person bringing the claim. And what that meant is every actor within a conflict, whether it was a, uh, a case of um, uh, a local power broker uh, in, in, in political party terms, um, enacting violence upon, say, a shopkeeper, or whether it was domestic violence um, between a uh, woman and their spouse's family, whether it was a mother-in-law, a father-in-law, because it could be any of those. Um, these were all community violences. So that refusal to privatize um, conflict. Um, and that meant that the answer had to be community-based. It meant that the response had to come from everybody. And everybody had, it was, to use Vasuki's language, it was our struggle, not their struggle or her struggle. Um, and it usually meant that there was, one of the things they did is they set up these legal clinics that would pop up, they were like pop-up legal clinics. Um, and what it meant in kind of legal issues, it bypassed the national courts um, and it brought, and these were volunteer lawyers from the city who were the middle class members of the organization. And I sat many Saturdays in those legal clinics um, and they would take maybe the union's building for that day, the CITU union building. And they had them in different, different neighborhoods in New Delhi, but they did this in the South. I visited them all over the country. And that technique of developing a people's court system is something I would love to see. And their rulings were more effective than the rulings coming from the federal or the state level courts. Because, and you would see more of the, the families, the husbands and the husband's families come to those courts precisely because the alternative was going to a state level court or a city level court. And the cost of that was so much more. And the potential for um, economic ruin was so much more. Whereas these were negotiated settlements and then they were community held and community backed settlements. Um, I hope that answers, that was a long answer. No, it's, a, it's, it's very instructive in terms of what we often talk about community safety mm -hmm. <laughs> and collective responsibility and accountability. Sometimes we throw out those things and are not necessarily familiar in how they could be placed into action. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's good to hear hear that. Yeah, I mean to create a whole other court system. Yeah, that's a people's a people's a people's uh, yeah, yeah system. Yeah, it was incredible to see. I'm wondering we have uh, opportunity for another question or comment. I have a million questions about the fearlessness aspect that I know you said you wanted to write more about, but mm -hmm. that you witnessed um, in your time with Aidwa. Mm -hmm. Partly because I think in the US context, we hear so much about fearless leaders or fearless individuals, mm -hmm. but much less often a fearless group, a fearless collective, a mm -hmm. fearless force. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you felt like you could identify some of the maybe the organizing methods that built that level of fearlessness mm -hmm. or that developed that kind of mass leadership um, that could give that level of strength. Mm -hmm. That I think is a question that a lot of organizers that we struggle with because there's a lot to, there's a lot to fear every day. Yeah. And how do you build the kind of collective strength that can help you face it um, so that when you're looking at the police or whoever is in front of you threatening you, He's yeah. more scared of you than, than you are of him. Yeah. I, I tell this story in the book. Um, so one of the things that many AIDWA activists face is because they're spending so much time outdoors, um, organizing, going to meetings, leaving the locality, um, taking the bus alone, right? That's seen as non-normative, questionable behavior. And so a lot of times they face, they would tell me about it only when I came to know them better, um, about the kind of slander of their personal characteristics, whether they were immoral women um, for, for not being home. 
And woman, one woman told me, and that kind of wears you down. Um, like I've talked about the social boycotts where some of the women organized um, to the point where their own families, um, their own uh, partners were no longer willing to support the struggle and they continued anyway. And, and they would say, nope, I'm not giving up. So that kind of um, refusal of fear can be at, at as small a level as your, your own partner, right? Um, or as big as the upper caste, you know, large landowners refusing to sell you the basics to live. Um, so this one woman said that, that, you know, it was just constant drip, drip, drip of her being an organizer and not maybe they would come to her husband and say, what kind of man are you? Your wife is, you know, trotting all around. Um, you know, you can't control her. Um, she's not a moral woman. She's meeting her other boyfriends. She said, so finally I had enough. And she'd been doing all of this work outside of the kind of a little at a larger level than just their locality. So she met with some of her neighbors and she said, so look at our street. Look at the street we're on. What do you see? And they said, well, this street, it's always been like that. There's potholes and the lights are broken and, and it's scary at night. I don't like walking on the street because the lights don't work. And she said, you know, we could change that. And they're like, no, we can't. You know, the, the, the person who runs our locality is Congress. You know, we're not Congress party. We're never going to get those streets fixed. Those lights are never going to be fixed. She's like, oh, come with me. I think we can fix those lights. And so she gathered the women from her own neighborhood. Um, and they went to the, again, the district collector, the sort of local official for these kinds of things. And he, they went with her, and they saw his face change. She, they saw how she didn't come with a few cigarettes to give to him. They, she came empty-handed. And he, rather than make them sit out in the waiting room or not let them into the building at all, he brought them right into, her office, into his office right away. And the women from her locality saw that he knew who she was. Um, and they saw that she was, he was afraid of her um, and had to respect her. And they got their lights fixed, and they got the potholes fixed. And she said she didn't have to face the slander because they realized that she was doing something valuable um, and held a kind of power they'd never realized was possible. And so I don't know if that answers fearlessness, but I think it, it's as if every location for fear can be a place for change as well. It's the way of seeing fear rather as something that you step away from to avoid, you step into to shift. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I, and I think those are like decisive moments for folks that are in position of facilitating processes or folks that are in organizing positions also. Um, being able to shift that, that energy um, mm -hmm. and doing things with fear. Yeah. Like even if there's fear, you do it anyway because that changes yeah. something at that particular moment. If you step back, there there's also that fear that you're transmitting to others. And so being able to acknowledge, yes, this is scary. Yes, this is the state. Yes, they have everything that they need to just break me apart right now. What does it mean for me to stand up against this at this moment in front of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so not necessarily saying I'm not, I don't fear anything, but right. taking that, taking that as an opportunity to let others know that we could actually make this happen. I think that that's that's what I learned from your from your anecdote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to encourage folks who haven't gotten the book to get it. Um, 1804 has it here. We are very honored and pleased to work with Left, uh, Left Word, um, who have amazing selections of book, books. We have a couple of them. Get this yes. book. You could talk to Lisa afterwards. Um, I see the book not only as something that you get and read, but it's a guide and it's a reference in a lot of ways because it really does speak to the experiences of women in the global south who are not only standing up to their local system, but to a system that is 
global to the systems of imperialism, neoliberalism, capitalism, patriarchy, um, and who have had successes, mm -hmm. who have dared and have had successes. And we should learn in the current moment, which we are, again, from women in the global south who are daring to push forward um, in this moment that is so crucial for humanity. And so I want to thank you, Lisa, for being with us oh, tonight and making this me. back to New York stop <laughs> at TPF. Um, we love you. And those of you who haven't been to a revolutionary feminism chorus at TPF, um, our sister friend and comrade Lisa is also part of it. And so they're, the course is amazing. I'm not just saying that. Um, you should, when it comes back out, sign up for it. If you have already done it, share with friends. The idea is not to collect knowledge, is also to be able to gain that knowledge as strength and confidence to get into action and strengthen our actions to be able to affect change. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Lisa. We appreciate you. Thank you for, for coming out on a Friday night. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out and folks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate.